So I've been asked to give a brief overview of the current European regime for intermediary liability as it stands at the moment, with a view to identifying the gaps in the current framework and the controversy that those gaps have given rise to, and moving on perhaps a bit to a discussion of uh, to, to, to an a discussion of the indications that we have with regard to the way forward, and the indications that we have from the Commission as to their thoughts and intentions with regard to reforming the current regime. So what is the current European regime for intermediary liability? As I'm sure most of you already know, the main thrust of that regime is currently contained in the e-commerce directive. That's Directive 2031-EC. At the very end of that directive, we find Section 4. That's entitled The Liability of Intermediary Service Providers. And in Section 4, um, a set of so-called safe harbour provisions are contained. What are the safe harbours? The safe harbours are essentially defences. They're immunities that are granted to intermediaries to protect them from liability that might otherwise arise in the provision of internet-related services. So in the e-commerce directive, we find a set of three safe harbours, one for the protection of mere conduit services, the protection of the provision of caching services, and the protection of the provision of hosting services. The most important of these three safe harbours is, in, I think, generally um, speaking, most people would agree, the latter uh, of the three, the hosting safe harbour. This is contained in Article 14 of the e-commerce directive. So I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to um, this one, the hosting safe harbour. What are the conditions for the enjoyment <coughs> of the hosting safe harbour? Uh, in order to enjoy the protection of the hosting safe harbour, an intermediary must not have had knowledge of the fact that it is hosting illegal information, and if it does have such knowledge, then it must act expeditiously to take down or block that information. Now, a little bit more attention is necessary here because the knowledge threshold changes depending on the type of liability from which the intermediary is seeking protection. So if the intermediary is seeking protection from criminal liability, then the knowledge threshold is one of actual knowledge that it is hosting illegal information or content. If, on the other hand, the intermediary is seeking protection for civil liability, then the threshold is a bit lower. In that case, the intermediary must not have had awareness of facts or circumstances from which it becomes apparent that it is hosting illegal information. Um, so essentially what Article 14 of the e-commerce directive does is it hints towards a so-called notice and takedown regime. However, a little bit of attention is necessary here because the uh, Article 14 notice and takedown regime is not as detailed and elaborated as equivalent regimes that we find in uh, national jurisdictions in Europe and also other jurisdictions across the world. Most notably, for example, it is to be contrasted with the notice and takedown regime that uh, exists in the US under the DMCA rules, the rules of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which offer quite a detailed procedure for notice and takedown. Also, another little bit of attention is required because while I say that Article 14 institutes a sort of notice and takedown regime, it's important to understand that the knowledge that the intermediary may have that will deprive it from the protection of Article 14 need not necessarily arise from notice. So the uh, intermediary may also acquire that knowledge through other means and in particular through proactive investigations on its own part. If it stumbles across information that indicates illegal activity through those, um, uh, uh, through those investigations, then it will be deprived again from the protection of the hosting safe harbour. So is that all of the information that we have at the moment with regard to the intermediary uh, liability regime that exists in Europe? Not entirely. This regime has in the meantime, of course, been interpreted by the European Court of Justice that sits in Luxembourg, the CJEU. What has the CJEU said about this regime? So I think the most important cases in this regard continue to remain the Google France case and the L'Oreal versus eBay cases. What have those cases said? Well, those cases remain controversial to some extent. Um, in those cases, essentially what the CJEU did is it took the opportunity of the questions presented before it to, depending on your point of view, clarify the current intermediary liability framework or add an additional condition for the enjoyment of that framework by intermediaries. What does that mean? Essentially what the CJEU did is it relied on the title of section four of the e-commerce directive, which as you might recall reads the liability of intermediaries intermediary service providers to declare that in order to enjoy the protection of the safe harbours, 
service providers must be intermediary. It then defined the notion of an intermediary by reference to Recital 42 of the e-commerce directive, and it declared that in order to be intermediary, a service provider has to be sufficiently neutral. And this means that the services that it provides must be of a mere technical and automatic and passive nature, such that they do not give rise to knowledge or control over the information which is transmitted or stored. Now, this has been a bit controversial, with a number of commentators arguing that um, Recital 42 of the e-commerce directive was never intended by the legislator to be applied to ho the hosting safe harbour, but only to the mere conduit and caching safe harbours. And this is particularly important for the hosting safe harbour, given the evolving nature uh, the, uh, of the notion of hosting over the decade and a half since the adoption of the e-commerce directive. So when the e-commerce directive was first uh, adopted, the notion of uh, hosting seemed to be pretty straightforward. It involved the provision of, uh, uh, of space on servers for the hosting <coughs> of web pages and so forth. In the meantime, however, with the evolution, the, 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 the emergence of modern Web 2.0, which rests on user-generated content, the notion of hosting has evolved towards intermediaries that perhaps have a bit more of an active role. So then the question emerges, does the hosting safe harbour protect those intermediaries? What has the CJU said in this regard? Well, that's not entirely clear. It has given some indications in Google, France and eBay, uh, L'Oreal versus eBay. What it has said is that the mere provision of hosting services, the provision of general information on those services, the setting of terms for the enjoyment of those services, and the rec uh, uh, receiving remuneration are not in and of themselves enough to deprive an intermediary of the protection of the, uh, of the safe harbors. However, if the intermediary is involved in drafting the content, in promoting that content or presenting that content, then it can no longer be considered sufficiently neutral in order to enjoy the protection of the safe harbours. So that's what we know on that front so far. Um, now, what's important to understand with regard to the, the safe harbour regime of the e-commerce directive is that it only protects intermediaries from liability in the very strict sense of the word. That is to say, uh, liability for monetary compensation. Each of the safe harbours contain a final provision in their final paragraphs which make it clear that the safe harbours are not able to protect intermediaries from liability for injunctive relief. And in particular, in the area of copyright, this possibility of injunctive relief has, against intermediaries has been given great effect by the European legislator. So in 2001, in the Copyright Directive, um, Article uh, In 2001, the Copyright Directive was adopted. Article 8.3 of the Copyright Directive instructs member states to offer right holders, the holders of copyright, the possibility of applying for an injunction. Member states must offer right holders the possibility of applying for an injunction against intermediaries whose services are used um, by third parties for the infringement of their copyrights. And in 2004, with the uh, Enforcement Directive, Article uh, 11 of the Enforcement Directive, expanded that obligation to all intellectual property rights holders. So all intellectual property rights holders must be given the possibility of applying for, uh, for injunctive relief, relief before a court for the protection of their copyright. Now, might any kind of obligation be imposed on intermediaries in this way through injunctive relief? The answer to that is no. Limitations do exist. The most important of those limitations, or at least the most straightforward of those limitations, is again found in the e-commerce directive, and specifically in Article 15 of the e-commerce directive. Now, according to Article 15 of the e-commerce directive, member states may not impose on intermediaries general obligations to monitor the information which they transmit or store, or general obligations to actively seek out indications of illegality. So while injunctions may be imposed for the enforcement of copyright and other intellectual property rights on intermediaries, those are through injunctive relief, those obligations might not involve general monitoring. Is that the only limitation possible on um, the possible injunctions that can be imposed on intermediaries? No. Further limitations have also been introduced by the case law of the CJU. In particu of particular importance in this regard are the Sabam cases, so Sabam versus um, Scarlet and Sabam versus Netlog, as well as the more recent Telecable Veen case from 2014. 
Now, what the court did in those cases was, in addition to relying on Article 15 of the e-commerce directive, of course, um, it also interpreted intermediary liability as a question that involves clashes between fundamental rights. So it raised the question of intermediary liability in a way to sort of higher constitutional planes. It reverted to the very basic principles with, as contained within the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The relevant rights that were identified from the courts were, well, on the one hand of, hand, of course, the rights of copyright holders and the holders of intellectual property rights in general to the protection of their, uh, of their property. That's protected under Article um, 17 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights as a fundamental right. On the other hand, however, at the same time, we have the rights of the intermediary itself and of the users. So on the side of the intermediary, what has to be protected is the freedom of the intermediary to conduct its business. That's protected under Article 16 of the Charter, and on the part of the users of the intermediary, their rights to the protection of their privacy, their data protection, these are protected under Article 7 and 8 of the Charter, and of course their right to freedom of expression and information, protected under Article 10 of the Charter. As a result, what the court said is that when we have such clashes of fundamental rights, what's necessary is to find a fair balance between them so that the protection of one right does not disproportionately affect another right. Now, the court so far has not given us a great deal of information with regard to how to go about <coughs> striking a fair balance. In itself, however, this development is very interesting, it's very important. What it does is it reveals this sort of deeper dimension to the question of intermediary liability. It reveals intermediary liability as not simply a regular sort of mundane question of secondary EU law, but one that sort of affects our basic fundamental rights, human rights, the basic building blocks of our legal system and our society. And it's important in that regard to also consider that this is also the, the, the approach that has been taken more recently by the European Court of Human Rights based in Strasbourg, which has released a number of of cases, again in intermediary liability, again taking this fair balance approach. So that's the way the situation currently stands. Uh, what indications do we have with regard to how this framework will evolve? At the moment, um, things continue to be a bit murky. What we do have is a communication that was released by the Commission in May last year on the digital single market. There, the Commission indicated that um, it is going to work on preparing a fit-for-purpose regulatory environment for intermediaries that will also contain rigorous procedures procedures for the takedown of illegal content and um, uh, avoiding the takedown of legal content. That to me suggests the introduction perhaps of a more detailed notice and takedown or notice and action regime and indeed in a different communication from December 2015 on uh, a copyright, a more European modern copyright uh, framework. The Commission did speak about the introduction of a notice and action framework, and perhaps a bit more worryingly, at least from my perspective, even the introduction of a notice and stay down framework. In addition to that, in its communication on the digital sing single market, the Commission also indicated the uh, possible, and this is very intriguing, the possible introduction of a duty of care for intermediaries that will force them into taking more due diligence, taking more responsibility for the information that they transmit or store. So that's how things stand at the moment. It will be very intriguing to see how things develop in the future. And yes, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>